Hey there, Dango Stu here. Today's video is all about the humble outboard propeller and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. Before we get into all that propeller goodness, I've got another viewer t-shirt photo here. So this one here is Angelo from Lindhurst in New Jersey. Angelo's longtime viewer, you often see his comments as Vetterfellow, so thanks Angelo for sending that one in. Most people when they own a boat have a propeller that came with the outboard and it's kind of what they use and it's been okay. If you're buying a new outboard for an existing boat, quite often they'll actually take the boat for a bit of a run and do what they call propping it, which is finding the right prop for the boat, for the hull. The real crux of that process is trying to find a prop that has your outboard run in its ideal rev range when you're at full throttle. There's a lot of other stuff going on though, so I thought I'd take this chance just to start going through some of that and give you at least some of the basics. There are a few characteristics to a prop that I think are really important to understand. You'll often see two numbers on the side, not always, but most often, and they look like this. So you can see here with this example on this prop, it says nine and a quarter by 11. The first number, the nine and a quarter, is referring to the diameter of the prop when you're looking this way and the 11 is referring to the pitch of the prop when you held the prop this way. When they talk about the pitch of a prop you need to imagine that the prop's sitting in a solid and that if the prop did one rotation as it turned one rotation like this it would have moved 11 inches long. In this case this has got a nine and a quarter inch diameter and 11 inch pitch. When it does one rotation in the solid it moves 11 inches forward. Excuse my usual dodgy drawing, but hopefully this illustrates the idea of how that pitch translates to the prop moving through that solid. When you have a prop with a smaller pitch, you can see that as it rotates, it cuts this sort of sharper arc that means that by the time it's done this one rotation, it actually hasn't gone very far. When you change to a higher pitch, i.e. one that's more sort of forward slanting, for each rotation, you can see that shallower angle actually scribes a longer line through the water. And that's why this measurement between one rotation is the way they describe pitch. That movement of 11 inches forward doesn't really happen in the real world because you have slippage. It's a bit like driving a car on a wet day where the wheels are spinning in the water. So when a boat moves through water, you have about a 10 or 30% slippage of the prop in the water. What that means is as your prop spins in the water for every complete rotation, it's actually only gonna move about eight to say 10 inches forward. If you're really into your maths, you can actually figure out what slippage you're getting on your boat by figuring out what RPM your motor's doing, what gear ratio you've got, how many rotations your prop's actually doing per minute with this RPM, figure out how many knots you should get, figure out what you're actually getting, and that'll tell you the slippage you're having. So there's a bit of a fun thing if you can't sleep one night. Probably now what I consider the most important characteristic of a propeller that allows you to use it at all or not is the number of splines it has. If you look in here, you can see the number of splines and the diameter of the prop shaft. If that's not right, the prop's not going to go on the boat at all. If a propeller goes on a boat, chances are you can start to move forward. If it doesn't go on, you're going nowhere. But just because it fits on doesn't mean it's going to give you the performance you need to actually use the boat in any sort of practical way. Another characteristic of each prop is what it's made out of. You get some plastic sort of composite props, you get aluminium props, and you get stainless steel props. They're the most common ones in outboards. On larger boats, you get sort of brass props, this kind of thing, older boats, but generally when outboard, it's plastic, aluminium, or stainless. Each of these have advantages and disadvantages. Plastic's very cheap, aluminium's in the middle, stainless is the most expensive. A lot of very high performance props tend to come in stainless because stainless is quite strong and won't deform over time as much as aluminium will. But to be honest with you, it's a little bit of diminishing returns. If you ask me, I think aluminium has the best bang for buck. They will get damaged a bit more if you hit something. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. The bushing inside that we'll talk about a bit later on protects the gearbox of your outboard a little bit. But a dinged up aluminium prop isn't gonna be that expensive to replace down the track. Where is if you start hitting your nice stainless prop into some rocks, it's probably going to fare better, but there's probably still going to be tears when you look at the cost of replacing it. Another characteristic that's really apparent is how many blades it's got. A lot of Honda outboards I think you'll find have four blade propellers. Most of the others are three blade. Three blade I think is by far the most common. And there's not a huge difference between them. Ultimately, one of the things that's very important about a prop is the surface area of the blades. 
So as long as that total surface area is in this sort of required parameters, then you're kind of good to go. Obviously, if you've got four blades, they can be smaller. Three blades, they need to be larger. The diameter of a prop tends to increase with horsepower. That's pretty intuitive. You see a big outboard, you see a big prop. So here I've got two propellers. This is the original propeller I looked at, which has an 11 inch pitch. And this one has a nine inch pitch. It's a slightly smaller diameter, but not actually significantly smaller. So what it means is this particular propeller is like having a lower gear ratio, which means your acceleration is going to be faster. On the other hand, this propeller has your higher pitch, so it's going to have a higher top speed. And often it's a bit of a compromise depending on how you like to use your boat. The best way to think of it is to imagine you've got a car that's only got one forward gear, which is what outboards have. So if you jumped in your car and you said, what gear would I like to have? Would I like to only have first, only have second, only have third, etc.? So if I jump in a car that only has first, I can take off pretty quickly from the lights, but pretty quickly I'm gonna hit the red line of the motor. This one, I'm gonna be a bit more sluggish off the lights. I'm taking off in say second or third, but I'm not gonna hit the red line of the motor until a much higher speed. And that's pretty much what the decision of choosing your pitch is. If for example, you're towing a water skier, you might want a lower gear ratio, so a lower pitch on the prop. That way you can sort of get the boat out of the water onto the plane, you can pull the skier out of the water, but you don't necessarily need to go at a million miles an hour as your top speed. You might also consider a lower gear ratio if it's like a work barge or something, you're gonna be carrying a lot of weight and you just need that low gear ratio to push it, much as you would with that sort of truck analogy again. If, however, you're not really pulling that weight and your boat is quite light or whatever, you might find that that gear ratio is so low that very, very quickly you're hitting the red line of the motor. So say, for example, the red line of your motor is 5,500 RPM, but at full throttle, it's one who's got up towards six. Maybe you're hitting a rev limiter, maybe you're not, but you know you're well under geared. Generally, you don't change the diameter of your prop. The manufacturer will sort of have a recommendation saying for this horsepower motor, run with this diameter. What you normally do though is change to a prop that has a different pitch. And the general rule of thumb there is that for every one inch of change in pitch of a propeller, you'll either gain or lose 200 RPM at the top end. So in this case, we might say we're doing 6,000 RPM, way too high for the motor, past the red line of the motor. So we need to increase the pitch of the prop by two and a half inches. By doing that, we're giving ourselves those 500 RPM. You don't really know until you've got the boat in the water what the exact effect is, but it's good to have a general rule of thumb to predict what's likely to happen. If you've got access to loads of props, even still, it's great. It gives you a good idea of picking the one you want, and then you can tweak from there. It can get a little bit expensive if you're buying all these props. You're buying one going, mm, actually, it's not enough. Maybe I need to go a three inch greater pitch. But I think as long as you use that formula, you're going to get somewhere pretty close. There's a huge amount that goes into designing propellers. You know, it's quite a complex science. But hopefully this gives you an idea of what at least those two numbers mean. The idea of the diameter times pitch that you see written on a lot of props. But also just some of the things to bear in mind, the construction, and more importantly, the splines. I have in the past seen elbow manufacturers where you can say it's a Evinrude nine horsepower and they actually come in nine and 11 or 10 splines, whatever they are. So you really do need to have that spot on if the prop's gonna go on at all. Last thing I'll mention about props is the hubs on them. Previously, props used to have shear pins in them. So it was a softer metal pin that went through if the prop hits something, the shear pin would shear, unsurprisingly, and the prop would then spin on its hub. And that was designed to avoid damage to the gearbox, the prop shaft, all that kind of stuff. These days though, you have a rubber bushing. This rubber bushing is this bit in here. So you've got this inner hub with the splines on it, the propeller itself, and the rubber bushings in between the two. The advantage to that is it can take a few knocks, absorb that shock load, and then keep working normally. But when they fail, they're pretty much impossible to replace. I have heard people trying to press new ones in, but it's easier said than done. I've got another video on the symptoms of that bushing failing and ways you can fix it temporarily, but just something to really be aware of with modern props. The next thing I want to talk about with props is cavitation and ventilation. You hear these terms used a lot and they're not necessarily correctly understood a lot of times. Ventilation, I think, is a reasonably easy concept to understand. It's where air from an external source is being drawn into the propeller. A little bit maybe like when you pull the plug out of a bath and you get that little sort of vortex sucking air down. That air is either going to come from the surface of the water or potentially from the exhaust gases that 
come out through the center of the prop quite commonly. The exhaust gases coming through the prop aren't generally a big issue when they're going forward, a little bit when you're going astern. Props, by the way, before I forget to mention that, are very much tuned towards going forward. They favor that because that's the direction you go at speed and it's the direction you're going most of the time. So when props are designed, they're not symmetrical. They're designed predominantly to go forward, to have sufficient effectiveness in reverse, but to compromise that to give better forward performance. Where you have issues with ventilation generally is if the prop is sucking air from above. This can be because the motor's mounted too high on the transom or that the motor's trimmed up too high. Another thing that happens when you turn a boat is if you have it trimmed, as you turn the boat, the prop sits there and say this is the water level and as the boat turns, the prop actually comes higher in the water. So you might find you experience a bit of ventilation during a hard turn. An obvious sign that your boat's suffering from ventilation is that you'll hear that air sucking sometimes, but you'll also hear the revs increase. It's the, the sort of viscosity or the non-compressible nature of water that gives that motor something to work against. So when that propeller's got air around it, there's not that resistance on the motor, and so the revs will just sort of go through the roof. So if ever you hear your outboard suddenly rev, you can either suspect the bushing in the prop or ventilation. To help with that, you can simply trim the motor down before you do any hard turns. I also recommend that you trim the boat down when you come into a, a dock, you come off the plane, you're coming in to do some manoeuvring in a marina or something. If you trim the motor all the way down, you'll get better bite in reverse and you'll also get sort of stronger manoeuvring. Ventilation can be helped a little bit by a hydrofoil, which is something I'm going to be putting on the green machine in a week or two. And I'll definitely do some before and after tests. How high can I trim it without the hydrofoil? How sharp can I turn? All that kind of stuff. But that'll be coming in a video soon. Now, the other one is cavitation. Now, cavitation is actually air or gas that's created under the water. It's not air that's sucked down. And the way it's created is by having a low pressure on the front of the propeller. And that low pressure actually causes the water to boil. It's not boiling in the sense of getting to 100 degrees, although propellers actually can get surprisingly hot underwater. I've had a propeller fracture a whole blade after running upriver for a bit of an emergency we had and eventually just the heat fracture went through it because of the friction in the water. So it can happen, but that's not what cavitation is. Cavitation is the water boiling or becoming a gas because the pressure is reduced. So the more you reduce the pressure, the lower the boiling point is. But it's a little bit like when you open a bottle of champagne. All of a sudden, all this gas or this carbon dioxide that was dissolved in the liquid suddenly becomes a gas again. So propellers work by having this low pressure on the front bit of a high pressure on the back, and that sort of what gives you your thrust. Now, when you have cavitation, there's a few obvious signs of it. One is that you'll get a bit of a vibration. The other is you might start to see a bit of pitting on the propeller. That cavitation actually acts like a bit of a, a water hammer, a bit like that knocking you kind of get in your plumbing system sometimes. That little microscopic hammering action will actually start to put some pitting on your propeller. So. Definitely if you see that, you're feeling a vibration, you've got to consider cavitation as the cause. Now where ventilation is pretty easy to fix, you either mount the motor lower, keep it trimmed down lower, avoid really hard turns, whatever, install a hydrofoil. Cavitation is a little bit trickier. Cavitation can be caused by a bit of damage to the prop, causing sort of unusual areas of low pressure around the prop. But it can also be caused by the surface area of the prop or the, the total surface area of the blades, the propeller, being low relative to the total diameter. So by having larger blades, more of them, maybe going to a four blade prop instead of a three, etc., you can solve some of your cavitation problems, but it tends to be a little bit trickier to sort out. Because of that, you might want to get some advice from a propeller specialist. Speaking of propeller specialists, I once spoke to the guy who owned Solas, which is a propeller manufacturer. Some of these, I think, are Solas props. One of them's, I think, Yamaha, whatever. And he said to me, yes, you know, people often talk to me about choosing props. And he said, yeah, after selling uh, 50,000 props or whatever, you know, you start to know a thing or two. And, and I could respect that. You know, I think experience is great. Unfortunately, I never got around to organizing to sort of meet up with him and try and do this video in conjunction with him because I think he would have had lots of great information to share. But one thing Solus do have is a prop selector. So I'll show you that on the computer. It's actually something you can get to from the marineengine.com website. And it's really good to help you just sort of generally pick the prop that's most likely to be right for your motor. I don't think there's any substitute for 
trial and error really with props because hull shape, all sorts of things come into it, the weight of the hull. But I'll show you this prop selector because I think it's actually a really useful tool to have. On the front page to marineengine.com, you'll see in the middle down here at the bottom, there's this Solas outboard propeller selector. And if you click on that, and you'll see down this side, it's got a sort of four step prop finder. Here, for example, I can select my outboard, which is a Honda. It's a 40 horsepower. And then here we'll see, this is the thing I was saying about 13 spline being the critical thing. My upward's about a 2010, so it's definitely 95 and newer, which means it's one of the 13 spline. And then here for the hull type, this is kind of the critical thing that an outboard manufacturer can't take into account when they're selling you an outboard of the shelf, is what sort of boat it's going onto. In this case, I'm just going to call it an aluminium bay boat. I'll say I want an aluminium prop. I want a standard right hand turning propeller and a three bay propeller. Here now if I click search I'll get a set of results that show me all the propellers that I can use and ideally I guess I'm going to start somewhere around the middle range here. Go for about a 11 and a half inch diameter, start with a 12 inch pitch and then see how I fare. Alright well I've probably bored your senses with propellers now. I think the next related video will definitely be doing that hydrofoil because I think it's definitely a part of the whole sort of interaction of the surface of the water and the propeller, but for now I think we'll call it a day. I've got to apologise for this video being a bit late. I actually filmed a video on the weekend, spent all of Sunday doing a video on Dangar Island because I often get asked about the island, so I thought I'd do a whole sort of lap around the island, talk a bit about it, show you the whole, you know, four sides, whatever. Uh, but unfortunately the audio was really bad on that video, so by the time I sat down that night tried to edit it, I thought, ah, oh, this is unusable, you know, I can't do this. I decided not to give up on that though, because I'd like to do a lot more filming on water over the summer, so I've ordered a new mic that I'm hoping is going to solve that problem. So I'll keep you posted and hopefully get that one out redone sometime soon as well. Alright, well take care and I'll catch you soon. Bye.